good to be in Houston with 40 of my closest friends. <laughs> Um, before I get started, I want to give, I, I just want to say thank you to Sonia and the team from IPC Hebron for having us. Like, we're so excited to be here. We're so excited about what God's going to do today. And um, we walked into the room this morning and it was decorated just like this. And it, like when women do things, they just, they just do it. And it's just, it's beautiful. It was like just so nice to walk into. So thank you. Um, we're really excited to be here today. Um, so uh, my name is Shiny, and I am from Dallas. Um, I grew up in a suburb actually north of Dallas. I graduated from high school. I, I live in Plano. Um, graduated from high school. I stayed in Dallas. I went to college. And then, like most good Dallas girls, I did come to Houston to get out of my parents' <laughs> house. And I, I came to grad school down here. Um, and I have some really, really fond memories of being down here in Houston. And um, when I was here, I lived in an apartment off of 45 in Almeida, Genoa, and um, it was close to the old IPC Hebron, and so for like the last year that I was here, I attended church down there, and um, oh, good thing there's clinics. Um, and I have some really fond memories of going to church on IPC, and just the fellow time of fellowship, and the pastor and his wife were just so sweet and so welcoming, and um, I never thought I would come back 15 years later ministry. So if you take nothing away, oh, I'm going to ugly cry. <laughs> it's going down. If you take nothing away from what I say here today, just know that God has a huge plan for your life if you just let him do what he's going to do. So, okay, I'm done with that. Um, <clears throat> so fast forward, um, I got married. I have two kids. I have a nine-year-old boy and a six-year-old daughter, and my kids love to do science experiments. I don't know if y'all's kids like to blow things up in your house, but there's often a Saturday morning we're all walking to the kitchen and there's like full-blown science experiment happening. So I have them to thank for this little demonstration that I'm gonna show you. But I wanna talk and I wanna kind of um, piggyback on what Anu talked about and I wanna talk about your reactions when you hear God's promises spoken over your life or when you read them in the Bible, um, what is your reaction? Because I really believe that what your reaction is will really allow God, I'm like snotting all over the place, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sorry, um, is what really will unlock God's power in your life. So I'm going to step over here, I'm going to put this down for just a second. Okay, so can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. I can, I will yell. So I have two glass containers, they are exactly the same. This is not a magic trick, I'm not trying to trick you, it's straight up science. Um, so two glass containers. And I'm going to pour, I think I have some, thank you. Um, this is baking soda. So I'm going to pour some into each container. It is great value brand. <laughs> that makes a difference to anybody. And then I have two bottles here. Okay, so they look very similar, right? They're the same size bottle, same size color liquid in here. The first one that I'm going to pour in is just water. <clears throat> right? So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just water and baking soda. And I could give this to our resident bakers, the Joy or Joys, and they would turn this into some lovely cookies or cake that we would all eat together. Um, however, I'm not the baker, so that's just going to go in the trash. <laughs> um, so this liquid, again, looks very similar. But you'll wow. notice it's a different reaction, right? Can you all see that? Mm, yeah. <laughs> I will clean that up. <laughs> so it's a little different reaction, right? You get the bubbling, you get the bubbling over, and all of that. So just to start off, we all may look alike, we may look alike on the outside, we may even look alike on the inside, but all of us have different reactions when we hear God's promises and when we hear what's spoken over our lives. <clears throat> so I want to look at two examples from this passage, and I want to start with Zechariah. And um, I know you did a great job of reading it, but I'm going to read it again. <laughs> Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, uh, Abijah, his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. 
So what we know right off the bat is that these two have an incredible spiritual pedigree, right? They were born and brought up. They've probably been taught from the time that they were little about God and all his promises and what his word says about them. Like they have, they are the gold standard, right? Like they are the real deal. And we know that Elizabeth was barren. And we also know somehow they've done some old, some New Testament testing and they know that it's not Zachariah's fault. They know it's Elizabeth's fault. Like they're very clear in that. Elizabeth was the one with the problem. So Zechariah is doing his thing, he's a priest, and he's serving, and he's positioned to hear from God. Like he is burning the incense, he's in the Holy of Holies, and if anyone is going to speak, if God is going to speak to anyone, he's going to speak to Zechariah, because he's there and he's ready, and he's situated to hear from him. So Gabriel comes and talks to him, and Gabriel and says, the angel says to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. I'm going to skip down. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. So this is the promise that God has for Zechariah. And I want to break it down just a little bit, because what I read, what I saw when I read this, were three things. When Gabriel gives him a promise, he gives him, a, he gives him peace to start off with, he says, do not fear. He gives him a plan. You're going to have a son. And he names that plan. It's going to be John. Okay? And he gives him purpose. So when God has a promise for your life, it's going to come with peace. It's going to come with a plan. And it's going to come with a purpose. These words are not empty. So Zachariah listens. And he asks the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. <clears throat> Zechariah knew God and was positioned to hear from him. His background gave him the foundation to believe, but he questioned, how can I be sure? The Bible tells us Elizabeth was barren, not that Zechariah was old, or ha excuse me, not that Zechariah had issues. He already knew that he wasn't the problem in this equation. But then I thought, you know what, maybe he actually was, because maybe his doubt was another thing that was limiting, their, limiting them from having a child. So, they continue their conversation, and Zechariah, God shuts Zechariah's mouth so he couldn't talk himself out of his blessing. This is not necessarily a punishment, because if life and death are in the tongue, we have the power to react appropriately and either bring life to our promise or bring death to our promise. Sometimes we all need to close our mouths before we talk ourselves out of our blessings. Like, that's for me too. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that your promise won't come true. So we know Zechariah was a priest. He needed to be able to speak to fulfill his role in the community. He needed to, not being able to speak limit him, limited him in every capacity. It meant he couldn't work, he couldn't teach, he couldn't relate to people on a very basic level. But here's the flip side of that. Every person that he encountered would now bear witness to what God was gonna do in his life. <clears throat> his muteness was a sign for the entire community. And I, I can just imagine, like in a day without social media and without email, I mean, people still gossip, right? So I can only imagine the gossip that was spreading from like their little town and probably into the next town. <clears throat> and all of that was going to be a reminder of the blessing that God was going to do for them. John's birth would have been an eventual sign to the entire community, but Zachariah's immediate silence was a nine-month constant reminder of what God was going to do. Imagine how people talked about him and Elizabeth. So I want to tell you that what may seem like a punishment is really just an exponent. Okay, so I dropped some science on you. I'm going to drop some math on you now. <laughs> In a math problem, do you all know what exponents are? I have a nine-year-old. We're doing math. Maybe that's why this is like so fresh to me. So in, in math, an exponent is the little number next to the big number. So if you have like two to the power of two, right, the exponent is the little two next to the big two, and it means that you raise that to this level. Your punishment is going to raise your testimony to an exponential degree. So if you feel like you're walking through a punishment now, know that it's not a punishment. God's going to use it to magnify your testimony. Okay, so let's skip to Mary. <clears throat> so we don't know much about Mary. Um, we know that she is engaged to Joseph. We know that Joseph is a descendant of David, but we don't really know much about Mary's lineage. 
Um, so Gabriel, appear, the, the angel appears to Mary, and he says to her, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And it says that Mary was greatly troubled at this interaction. And the angel says to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. <clears throat> The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So again, we have the same thing here. He comes in peace, he comes with a plan, and a name for the plan, and he comes with a purpose. We don't know Mary's spiritual pedigree. We don't know if she comes from the same religious royalty like Zechariah and Elizabeth, but we know that she questioned as well. She knew the facts of her own story, and she genuinely wanted to know, like, how is this going to happen? She's like, hey, this is what it is. Is this really gonna, How is this going to happen? And I, I saw a difference there, because when I see Zechariah questioning, when I see verse, verses the way that Mary questioned, Zechariah looked, presented his questions with doubt. Mary question, Mary, Mary's questions came with a different intent. God's not disturbed by our questioning, but he's disturbed by our intentions. Are you making excuses, or are you asking him for clarification over your life? Zechariah already knew he wasn't the problem, but he presented it to God as though he was. Mary stated a fact, but there was no, and there was no doubt behind it. When you read in James, James says, if you ask, ask in faith. God's not scared of your questions. He's not scared of conversing with you. He wants you to ask him, and he wants you to ask him in faith. So I'm going to jump to one more example. We're going to go to Gideon, because I like Gideon. Gideon's story is found in the book of Judges, chapter 6. <clears throat> so the angel appears to Gideon, right? And Gideon's hiding. He's in the wine press, and he's, he's just hanging out there. <clears throat> and the angel says to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. And Gideon's response is like, Hold on, wait a minute. If the Lord is really with us, why is all of this happening? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us over to the hand of Midian. And they have this whole conversation, right? There's this whole exchange there that happens. Gideon responds as one who has read and studied the history of his people. He's like, hey, I know what you did before, but what's, how does that compare to what's happening now? Here again, we have the same structure. There's peace, there's a plan, and there's purpose that the angel tells Gideon as well. There's a dialogue. Gideon offers a sacrifice and gets instructions to cut down his father's Asherah pole and the altar to Baal. So we know that even though Gideon knew the history and the religion of his people, they weren't following it. They had already turned away. But Gideon knew in his heart that there was something else that God had for his people. And then we know there's the conversation there about the fleece and the ground. And the fleece needs to be dry, and the ground needs to be wet, and then we flip it. And then they continue, and Gideon, when Gideon gets his army, they even wean down the army. So there's this ongoing conversation. There's an ongoing testing that happens between the two of them. So again, like God's not scared of your questioning. It's all about your intent. Are you, are you coming at him with doubt? Or are you coming at him with genuine concern and, and genuine ability to build your faith? I want to close with this. Um, we love to read and believe all the big promises, like, I will make you a great nation, I will destroy your enemies, I will bless your descendants, and we're proud to get behind those promises. But God has also made smaller promises that we need to be just as proud to get behind. Promises like, I will go with you, I will give you rest. These promises are just as important as the others. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. God's promises will come true. They do not return to him void. But what will your reaction be? Will it be flat and doubtful, or will it be powerful and overflowing? <clears throat>